Um, so I want to start my session with a little bit of a poll. Our first poll question is, what is the first word that comes to mind when you think of gluten-free and nutrition? But I want to know what everybody thinks um, at the beginning of the session, and then we're going we're gonna to ask a similar question at the end to see if I've maybe changed your mind as we go through. <laughs> Hope today is to convince you that gluten-free baking is always delicious and that there are lots of things that you can incorporate into your baking to make them even better for you. So we're going to talk about the nutritional properties of so gluten-free ingredients, talk about how to make mixes with them, create your own flour mixes, and um, my favorite topic of the moment, using alternative fats in our baking. So the first um, uh, ingredient that I want to talk about is almond flour. This is a, a pretty common ingredient that I'm sure most people have either tried before or have seen a product that is made with it. Um, almond flour is made from raw blanched whole almonds that are ground into a very, very fine powder. Now what's interesting about almond flour is that you could buy four different brands of almond flour and open the packages and they would all look completely different. Um, and it's, what's different about them is how finely the manufacturers grind them. And the level of how much they've ground them will change how your baked goods come out. So if it's a, a more coarsely ground almond flour, it's something that you might want to think about using for breading uh, chicken fingers or fish sticks. Uh, whereas if it's a very fine powder, it would be something that would be better replaced in a, in a baked good. Um, almond flour is extremely nutritious for us. Um, it is packed with protein and fiber, um, manganese, and vitamin E, um, all of which have extremely good um, health properties for us. The other really nice thing about almonds, um, there was a statistic a couple years ago that came out from the almond board that you can eat eight almonds and feel full for several hours. Um, you wouldn't think that eight little almonds would do that for you, but it really does help you feel fuller for a much longer period of time. And the same is true in your baked goods when you use almond flour. So when you, when you bake with an ingredient like almond flour, your muffin will keep you full longer than a muffin made with a more refined um, white flour, like a white rice flour, for example. Um, baked goods made with almond flour are very soft. Um, it also reduces the total um, carbohydrates. Yeah. You can use almond flour as a one-to-one -one replacement in baking, but I always like to do things as a mix. There, there are several cookbooks that are all about almond flour um, as one-to-one. -one. Some people love it. For me, I, choose to, I, I would prefer to do it in a blend, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Coconut flour is another one of my favorite ingredients. It's made from dried, defatted coconut meat. Uh, it has an extremely high fiber content in it. So when you do use coconut flour in baking, you always want to use an equal amount of flour to, um, to liquid, whether it's water or milk or um, a juice to sweeten. Um, you always want to have um, more liquid. Um, I love blending coconut flour with almond flour. It's one of my favorite combinations, and you'll see that recipe um, later in the presentation. But you don't really want to use coconut flour on its own. Um, the only time I've actually seen coconut flour used on its own very successfully was in Thailand when they, they made uh, coconut pancakes. And it was absolutely just coconut flour and coconut milk, and they put it on the pan, and it somehow all stayed together and worked. And it tasted really good. Um, but I wouldn't recommend doing it on its own. Um, it has, gives a very rich texture and it's naturally sweet, so you can reduce the amount of sugar um, in your recipe as well. Um, coconut flour, the nutritional is a quarter cup, is 11 grams of fiber, 5 grams of protein, and 2 grams of saturated fat. And a lot of websites provide nutritional information for these ingredients, but they're all different amounts. Some will say one tablespoon or a cup, so I've converted all of them for the purpose of this presentation to a quarter of a cup, so you can compare them to each other equally. Brown and white rice flours, these are the most common ingredients that you will see in gluten-free baking and in most of the packaged products and also in most of the all-purpose flour blends that are on the market. Um, they're, they're made from uh, finely ground white or brown rice grains and can be used completely interchangeably in recipes. The big difference is that brown rice flour is the whole grain version of, of white rice flour, so brown rice flour is inherently better for you. Um, Brown rice flour is much higher in protein, iron, fiber, and vitamin B, and it contains all of the healthy things that, is, that are stripped from the white rice flour. So if you had to pick one of them, I would definitely recommend the brown rice variety. You will not know the difference. The rice flours can also be very gritty when used alone, so I would definitely also put them as part of a blend. But as you can see, um, brown rice flour has double the nutrient uh, fiber from white rice flour. So if you're picking one, I would advocate picking the brown rice variety. Has anyone in the room ever used teff flour? 
All right, we have a couple of hands around the room. So Teflower is um, an interesting product that not a lot of people use, as you can see by the, the number of hands that just went up. Teff is the smallest grain in the world, and it's, um, it has a very unique flavor. It's mostly used in Ethiopian um, cooking to make their um, traditional injera bread. And several years ago, I guess now, I went on a quest to find all gluten-free teff in Washington, D.C., because it's supposed to be made with 100% teff flour. That's how it's made in Ethiopia, so why wouldn't it be made that way in America? Unfortunately, that is not the case in America, because teff flour is extremely expensive. Um, and after my husband and I made several trips to a restaurant um, downtown that claimed to have all teff in Jara, we found out the reason that more restaurants, uh, more Ethiopian restaurants don't have the all teff and jara is because there's only one flight a week into Dulles from Ethiopia. So they have an extreme shortage of teff and it's very expensive. So um, it's not super easy to come by, but Bob's Red Mill does have, um, is manufacturing it now so you can get it from them. Um, it's a great source of fiber, protein, iron, amino acids, vitamin C, and calcium. So I would definitely recommend trying it out. Um, again, the quarter cup is five grams of fiber and five grams of protein, which really packs a good nutritional punch. Um, millet flour is a flour that I only began experimenting with a couple of years ago. Um, it's very, very mild. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, when you, when you work with these alternative grains, especially the bean flours, they tend to have this very distinctive smell and taste to them that isn't always welcome in your cookies. Um, I don't really want to smell black beans when I'm eating a chocolate chip cookie. Um, so it's, I like to find ingredients that are just kind of you know under the radar and let you enjoy the cookie for what it is. Um, and millet flour is really one of those ingredients. You can replace about a quarter of the flour in your recipe with millet flour. Um, and it just gives this like really nice cake-like crumb to, um, to bake products. Um, it's, a, it's a whole grain, um, so it has whole grain nutrition in it and a very mild flavor, so I would definitely recommend blending it with others. Um, you'll hear me talk about sorghum in a minute, which is my favorite ingredient of all of these, but it's a really nice blend with sorghum flour. Um, packed with protein, amino acids, and fiber as well. Um, and again, the, comp the quarter cup comparison, three grams of protein and four grams of fiber. Now, sorghum flour. So most of us probably know about sorghum from hearing about gluten-free beers because they, they malt the sorghum grain in order to make gluten-free beer products. Um, has, has everyone tried a sorghum-based beer here? If you haven't, you should go to Bard's Beer. They're in the, in the ballroom today. They have 100% uh, malted sorghum beer. It's naturally gluten-free, and that was really my first experience with sorghum flour. And the owner of their company suggested one day that I, that I cook with their beer. He's like, it's this awesome sweetness, and it's much better for you than using um, like a sh like sugar or using syrup or maple syrup. Um, and it's carbonated, so it will help my baked goods to rise. So I did, and I'm now totally obsessed with it. Um, you can make pancakes with gluten-free beer. Um, you can really make anything with gluten-free beer as your liquid. Um, and you get the natural sweetness from the sorghum and the carbonation, which helps your baked goods. Um, so then, of course, I had to start experimenting with sorghum flour. And they take the whole grain sorghum, and they grind it into a fine flour. It also has this very lovely natural sweetness to it. Um, so you can also cut down on sugar in these recipes. Um, the other really nice thing about sorghum is that the starch in it takes longer to digest than other um, processed grains. So it can, it can slow down um, the rate that it's processed. And so this is good for people who are on a low glycemic diet and with diabetes. Um, it has this super, super smooth texture. So um, I would definitely, Okay, so when you buy these flowers, the first thing I would tell you to do is to open them all and touch them and just see what they feel like. Because what they feel like on their own, um, on your cutting board, is sort of what they're going to feel like in your mouth when you're eating them in your cookie. So you don't really want to eat something that's like really gritty and coarse and like a bad texture. Um, so you want something that on its own feels really nice. Um, like I said, it's malted to make gluten-free beers. Um, also very, very high in protein, iron, and fiber, um, with three grams of fiber and four grams of protein per quarter cup. Tapioca flour is another super common ingredient that we see in gluten-free um, flour blends. Um, it's a very common one in the all-purpose flours that you're going to buy. It's extremely starchy, um, so you never want to use it on your own. Uh, if you try and use a cup 
of tapioca flour in place of a cup of all-purpose flour, you will just have a glob of goo. Uh, it will not work. Um, the only application that tapioca flour works for in, in that instance is to make Brazilian cheese bread. Uh, which is a very, very sticky um, bread. If anyone's ever had it, you can like pull it apart and the cheese is all ooey and gooey inside of it. And it has a lot of oil in it that helps you be able to pull it apart. But it would not work to make a, a birthday cake or anything like that. So you would definitely want to use it in a blend. It's made from the cassava plant, so it's actually extracted from the root. Um, it gives a very, very nice crisp crust to breads, uh, which is why you do see it added to a lot of all-purpose blends. Um, has anyone in the room had Brazilian cheese bread? Okay, so lots of people have experimented with this cheese bread. So you know that the outside of the cheese bread is a very, very crispy crust, and then you break inside of it, and that ooey gooeyness that I was talking about, that's how the tapioca um, reacts. It's very smooth, so you can also use it as a base in sauces and soups. So if you're going to make a roux, you could use it in place of cornstarch or potato starch. Um, it has almost no flavor to it, so that's great. The one thing I will caution, though, is that if you do use tapioca flour to make a roux, don't wait for it to turn a dark brown. It won't. It will just stay white forever. So you'll just stand there stirring and stirring. Why isn't this turning brown? Why isn't it getting golden? It will never turn golden. So, yes. So don't keep waiting. Um, so if you do want to use tapioca flour in place of cornstarch, you're going to use two tablespoons of tapioca flour for every one tablespoon of cornstarch that you would use. The sad thing about tapioca flour, it is basically nutrient void. So no fiber, no protein, not one of the best ones to use, but it does help. I, I point it out because it is something that can help your baked goods have a, that crust on the, on the outside of it. Um, also, if you want to prevent burning your roux, it's a great one to use too. Soy flour. So soy flour is a fantastic ingredient to use if you have experimented with it or you're using a recipe that calls for it. Um, one of the really big problems with soy flour is that it burns super fast. So there's, there's not a lot of give with it. So when you, when you do use soy flour, I would highly recommend starting with a recipe that was designed for using soy flour. Um, but it has this lovely nuttiness to it, so it's great um, in like a banana bread recipe. Um, I, I usually use it for breakfast breads and muffins. And it also makes things very light and fluffy, so it's just a nice flour to use for um, breads. Um, it's also very, very high in fiber and protein, three grams of fiber and 10 grams of protein for that same quarter cup. Buckwheat flour. So I know a lot of people, the first thing they think when they hear buckwheat is, we can't have that, it's not gluten-free. Well, contrary to what the name sounds like, it is naturally gluten-free. Um, it's actually made from whole ground buckwheat seeds, which are related to the rhubarb plant. And it has, again, very high levels of fiber that can help to stabilize blood sugar levels. Um, it's also packed with protein and calcium. And it's a, it's a really pretty color. So not everyone likes having, um, say, a cookie, a, sh a shortbread cookie that is darker in color. It's sort of like a grayish purple color. Um, but I think they kind of look like lavender. And, you know, it's uh, better nutrients for you, and it gives you natural coloring to your, to your cookies. Um, you can replace, you can do a 100% replacement, and a lot of restaurants, especially diners, are, are making 100% buckwheat pancakes for the gluten-free consumers. Um, but I would prefer it in more of a 50-50 blend with other, other products. I think you'll like it a lot more. And again, four grams of fiber and four grams of protein per quarter cup. So now we're going to look at the nutritional comparison of all the different flours to see how they stack up next to each other. And uh, one thing I want to know about everyone in the room is, is how much do you care about this when you're looking at, when you're, when you're buying products and when you're baking. So for everyone in the room, when you, when you buy flour or you buy a packaged product, do you look at the nutritional labels? So we can go ahead and, and take a vote. So I'll move on to talking just briefly about creating your own all-purpose flour blends. It is very easy to go to the grocery store and buy an already created um, blend of flour, go home and make your cookies. But I would encourage you to at least try to make your own blends. And I hope because you're all here today that you, you will go home and you will try this out. Um, there are a few tips that I have for you if you do choose to go and make your own. Um, first of all, always make a large batch because the worst thing for me is to decide that I need to make cookies today and have no flour to do it with. So I always want to make sure that I have a large bin of it made. I actually um, I have two of those very large containers that you can also use for dog food. 
uh, which sounds silly, but I also have a dog food scoop for it. Uh, but they seal to be airtight, so you can store the flour in them for a longer period of time than if you just kept it in um, a Ziploc, which might not stay sealed all the time, or just a Tupperware container. So I do, that's how I make my flour, um, in an airtight container, so you want to make sure that, you, that it's always sealed. And before you buy large quantities, I would recommend trying a variety of blends because everybody really has a different favorite blend. In our classes that we teach at Children's National, we, we have three different blends that we use and no one can ever agree on which one they like the most and it's really just personal preference. So I would highly recommend trying out several different ones. Um, I'm going to give you three recipes today, but just Google gluten-free all-purpose flour blends and you'll find hundreds if not thousands of them online. So. Um, Experiment with them and find one that you like in all of your recipes. Okay, so this is the, the first blend. This is a basic blend. If you're going to do this one, it's almost better to just buy one that's pre-made for you because this is really what you're going to find in most of the major manufacturers' blends. Um, it's a combination of brown rice flour, cornstarch, tapioca, and xanthan gum. Um, it's a very starchy blend. It's the cheapest blend that you'll be able to make because um, rice flour, cornstarch are very, very cheap ingredients and easy to find in any grocery store. I think you could actually find all these ingredients with the exception of xanthan gum in a 7-Eleven or CVS stores now. Um, you simply blend the four ingredients together and go ahead and use them to bake. And you can store them in an airtight container for up to a month. The second one is a high protein and fiber all-purpose blend. This is a combination of sorghum flour, tapioca flour, coconut flour, and xanthan gum. And this is my personal favorite, um, but again, my personal favorite might be someone's least favorite. So I would recommend trying many of them. Um, this one is loaded with protein, iron, antioxidants, and fiber. So it's a great blend to use for baking. Um, and again, I have that little bit of um, tapioca flour in there to give you a sturdy crust on all of the baked goods. And you don't worry about having to um, write down these exact recipes. All the slides are available online. And they're actually in the handouts. I think the recipes are in the handouts that you got as well. Um, and then again, the coconut flour gives a natural sweetness so you can drop down the amount of sugar that you will put into the recipes. Again, blend them together and you can store them for up to a month. Uh, the third one is a high protein and low glycemic blend. It is a blend of buckwheat, almond flour, and coconut flour. Again, a really, really lovely blend of flours, which will cut down on your carbohydrates and boost protein. Um, and again, like we talked about in the beginning, that almond flour is naturally low in the carbohydrates. So it's um, more protein and will keep you full for longer. Again, just mix them together and you can store that up for, for up to a month. Okay, so now, who in the room has ever baked with avocados? Okay, we've got a bunch more people than I expected to say that. Okay, so I talked about lavender cookies um, if you use buckwheat flour, but how about green pound cake? Come on, right? <laughs> um, so you can use avocados as a one-to-one -one substitute for butter in baking. Um, by choosing to use avocados, you're adding nearly 20 vitamins and minerals to the baked goods um, and dramatically cutting down the amount of saturated fat by approximately 75%. So it's a really, really, really good replacement technique. Um, but again, like I said, it will turn your baked goods green, a really lovely pale pistachio-like green. So um, I, would, I would definitely recommend trying it. If you use it in something in a chocolate cake, for example, nobody will have any idea that you've used um, avocados instead of butter. Um, but it, it, was, it was humorous making a pound cake with avocados. It was a beautiful color, though, so I would highly recommend it. Greek yogurt. So you can use Greek yogurt as a one-to-one -one substitute, but I, I would not recommend it. I would recommend doing a half-to-half -half replacement. Um, I think you'll be a lot happier with it. It, it almost makes things too moist to do it um, on a 100% replacement. Um, so just to talk a little bit about, one of the questions I get all the time is what's different between using Greek yogurt and using just regular yogurt? Well, it's, it's how the straining process works. And the way that they strain all the way off, it has less sugar, fewer carbohydrates, and more protein than traditional yogurt. But now the, the flip to that comes if you buy a flavored Greek yogurt or a brand that is highly processed, in which case they, they do that, but then they add sugar back into it. So it sort of defeats the purpose. Um, so you want to make sure that you pick an all-natural, plain Greek yogurt to really get the maximum nutritional benefit from it. And if you do pick one of the all-natural ones, you're getting about twice the protein as well as regular yogurt. 
the key word you're going to want to look for on the label to make sure you're getting a good one is you just want to see the words milk and live active cultures in the yogurts. Um, there are a lot that, um, that use fruit as a natural sweetener, which those are fine. Um, just make sure there's no added uh, sugars to them and that they haven't used a stabilizer like cornstarch or carrageenan. Olive oil. So olive oil is one that I've just recently started experimenting with in larger quantities in my baking. Um, I used to re replace it a little bit, but I've, I've started to try and do it in a larger amount. Um, so to give you a comparison, one tablespoon of olive oil has 1.8 grams of saturated fat compared to 7.2 grams in one tablespoon of butter. So that's like a huge difference in the amount of fat that you're getting. I would recommend using the extra virgin olive oil type if you're going to do the replacement because it's the least refined and the most natural. You're going to have the most nutrients in it. So I found a great chart from Cola Vita on baking with olive oil. I only put in two of the um, quantities here, but on the Cola Vita website, they actually have it for probably two dozen different quantities for how to replace with butter. So their one cup butter is three quarters of a cup of olive oil, three quarters of a cup is a half cup plus one tablespoon. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. Unsweetened applesauce is another one that I love to use. With applesauce though, I would highly recommend sticking to quick breads, cakes, and muffins. Um, if, you, if you use applesauce in cookies, they get very, very cakey. Um, they're, they're like very fluffy and soft, so if you like your cookies that way, it's good. But um, if you want that crispy cookie, I would not recommend using applesauce in, in them. Um, it's a great, but it is a great way to cut fat, calories, and to boost your fiber in baked goods. Um, even though apples, the applesauce is unsweetened, apples are naturally sweet, and so it will naturally sweeten your baked goods. So you can also cut down on the sugar. You can do, again, the whole replacement, but I would recommend a half to a half replacement. That's where my presentation ends, but we have a couple of more questions for you. Okay, so after hearing this talk, do you plan to go home and make an all-purpose blend with these alternative grains? I hope it's all A's. Okay, so at least a majority said yes. <laughs> and the final question that we'll ask today is, after this presentation, what do you think of when you hear gluten-free and nutrition? Have I changed your mind at all? So we will make, that we've been collecting word clouds um, all throughout the day, and we will for the rest of the afternoon for our educational sessions. So we'll have all of them posted on the website as well, so you can see what people said, um, not only here, but all across who are watching at home. So thanks for coming, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. The question is, are, is there a particular bread maker that I would recommend? Um, no. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of uh, manufacturers that um, make bread makers and um, they have gluten-free settings on them, um, but I found that they all work approximately the same, even the ones that don't have a gluten-free setting on them. Um, even, sometimes I even just prefer to make bread by wrapping it in parchment paper um, to cook it in the oven myself, um, but I think that they all uh, perform approximately the same. We have a question from our online stream. Okay. Uh, from a pizza maker. Okay. He wants to know if you are cooking uh, with gluten-free flour in like a wood-fired pizza oven, if uh -huh. you change the temperature or if it will bake differently, rise differently. Than yeah. Flour. Okay, so I would never use soy flour in a in a um, wood fire pizza oven. It'll burn almost immediately. So I would highly recommend against that. Um, I would super recommend using buckwheat flours and teff. Um, those are definitely the best for the higher um, temperature cooking. And we have one more question from our online universe. Okay. Um, does cooking with olive oil change the taste? If That's it. Versus like yes. oil or butter. Yes, so that is a really, really good question. So yes, um, olive oil does have a very distinctive taste and you will definitely taste it. Uh, if you're making like a chocolate cake, you probably won't taste it. Um, but using the extra virgin olive oil, it's the purest form and has the most olivey taste to it. So you probably will taste it in a lot of different things. But if you want to use olive oil and still um, get the nutritional benefit, or some of the nutritional benefits, you can use some of the light varieties of olive oil. Um, there's dozens of brands that market as a lightly flavored olive oil. You will not taste those. But just to point out, the light versions are a more refined oil. So you're going to lose some of the nutrients that you would get in the, um, the extra virgin oils. 
I love cooking with coconut oil. Um, I use it a lot, even to make things like fried rice um, in, instead of butter or um, other oils. Um, but the problem with coconut oil is there is a lot of saturated fat in it, so it doesn't always serve as the best replacement um, in large quantities, especially if you're going to use like a whole cup of it for, um, like for example, a Toll House cookie recipe. Um, what are your thoughts on using dairy-free yogurt and baking? Um, I've only tried the dairy-free, the only one I've ever actually experimented with is the So Delicious coconut yogurts. Um, I don't think that you get the same texture that you do with the, um, the Greek yogurt, but when, I, when I've, I've made probably a dozen recipes using it, and I mean, they turn out okay. They're, they're definitely edible and, and good. Uh, like my husband ate all of it, <laughs> um, so they will come out just fine, um, but I think the texture is a little bit off. All right, well, thank you very much for coming out today, and uh, have a great day. Enjoy the expo. <laughs>